cross-cultural negotiation. Okay, this kind of goes over some basics here. Uh, BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Uh, you know, the fact is when you're dealing in cross-cultures, sometimes the agreements don't work out and it's better just to, to have a good backup plan in case the negotiations don't work. Well, what's our alternative? A distributive bargaining versus integrative bargaining. You know, are, are you guys hard pressed? Is it is it a win lose type environment, or is it win win? Can you find ways to, to be problem solvers and to, to make good on the negotiations? Um, one aspect I decided to include here: are the cross cultural negotiation. The relationships matter. Okay, so when you're negotiating in an environment where it's the United States, in the United States, sometimes you know, a lot of times actually, the best price wins, no matter what. And uh, in other environments, a lot of times for a particular topic of discussion, for a particular product or negotiation that you have, maybe the other company may not be able to, to come down anymore on the price. So in an American environment, they wouldn't get the contract. Well, in a foreign environment, you have to be mindful of that because they may place more emphasis on the relationship than that and this particular item they can't come down on but maybe you can make the money up on future negotiations so you have to really be mindful that in a lot of other countries they're not in it for the short haul they're in it for the long haul and and you have to you know make sure that you act with that interest you know or I guess it depends on how long you're planning on being a country if you're there for one deal then but if you're there for if you want to, to continue to succeed in a foreign market, you have to be mindful of that. Uh, use of interpreters or translators. You could uh, hire someone, you know, a professional interpreter to sit at you with the discussions and the negotiations to make sure that both parties understand what's being discussed and what's being said. Uh, that's a great tool to use. Sometimes it's, it's you know, in terms of negotiations, I would say it's, it's very affordable considering the repercussions it could be if it uh, goes wrong. You know, if you just try to do it yourself and negotiate in the home language, you could be doing yourself a, a disfavor. So, emotional intelligence, how able you are to pull your emotions out of the negotiation and see it for what it really is and don't get caught up in all the details and how it affects you. Business intelligence, this has a lot to do with uh, global negotiation. You know, what local environment factors have implications on your negotiated outcome? What I mean by that is that when you're dealing in a foreign environment, are there other things that can that can change how how the how the outcome of the negotiation is? For example, uh, is there an envelope that you're supposed to pay? Is there uh, some kind of uh, political loophole that you need to to jump through? Is there uh, is there any kind of you know, tax or, or union that you have to work with? You have to do your, again, do your homework when you're, when you're negotiating. You have to make sure that you really uh, go through all the details of everything, how you're able to, to succeed in that, in that market. And again, we went through that in the last slideshow, but here it applies to the negotiations. You really need to do your detailed research on, on, on what you're getting yourself into when you go into a foreign environment. Uh, break your strategies, you know, how, how you guys can work out your details for future negotiations and you know, come through to a, to a good agreement. Refer to a field example. I, I put that on the last presentation that had the uh, baseball game. Basically, who are the players that are involved in the negotiation? You know, know who, know who the, each player is and who, which parties are involved and, and what they have to, to gain or lose. HR and expatriates. Okay, this is basically, you know, these, this first section, I could have broken this up into two slides, but where do companies hire from? Domestic companies will hire domestically typically. International companies would hire domestically and send them out to different areas throughout the world, their managers, for example. And sometimes they, you know, once they go and set up a factory or something, they'll hire locally, but typically international companies hire hire domestically and send them abroad. Multinational companies would hire from, this goes on a diversity aspect, they would hire from abroad and bring them uh, to the home country. 
uh, it gives them the advantage of, of being a, a diver diverse company. Global companies, they hire and fire and, and deal with their HR uh, as it comes. Basically, here abroad, the managers can be sent from one country to another country. Basically, they're taking advantage of their, of their diverse managerial workforce, they're taking advantage of, of the experience of their expatriates, they're taking advantage of, of everything to, to make themselves you know, a better player in this global economy. Stages of expat experience. Okay, this one, basically what this means is that when you are engaging in an expatriate experience, you're really signing up for a lot. It's, it's not an easy undertaking and typically it lasts for a number of years. So, uh, you, you start out at one point, we call this the honeymoon phase. Then eventually you're going to find it hard to, to adjust to that culture. You experience what's called culture shock and you know, you're going to be feeling a lot of uh, stress and a lot of maybe resentment. Um, it's difficult to succeed when you're, when you're in a whole other country and you, it's just hard to, to really understand that culture for what it really is. It's called culture shock. Eventually you'll pick back up and you'll call it adjustment and you're going to get to the point where it's called mastery. You learn how to operate effectively in that culture. You know, it becomes, it becomes second nature. You know how to speak the language. You know how to act appropriately. You know how to involve yourself in the right ways in the different discussions, and, and you learn that culture. After that type of experience, if say the expatriate experience ends and you're brought back to your home country, one function that global companies uh, typically use, they would put those people uh, in the mentoring phase and they would they would you know help them to, to mentor the next round of expatriates that are going to that country or to another country so that they can you know give them the tools they need to succeed in those international environments. High percentage of assignments fail. I mean it's a brutal reality. It's hard. It's hard to adjust to that. Uh, especially when you have family integration. Is your wife going to be working there? Are, are your kids going to have to find schools? These are things that are important. And you know is it rewarding enough? You know some contracts involved uh, a good amount of risk. So, you know, if you're getting paid just a few extra dollars, is it really worth it to, to uproot yourself and go to another country? The bottom line here, turn off your culture, cruise control. You can't, you can't operate in another country by just kicking your feet up and, you know, doing, doing the normal do. It doesn't work that way. It takes a lot of uh, focus. It takes a lot of attentiveness. And it takes a lot of being able to adapt to circumstances that normally you don't have to deal with in your home country. So you have to be able to turn off your cruise control and you have to be able to constantly you know, focus on, on what you're trying to do. So cultural intelligence. Basically, what, what this graph here is saying is that uh, you're going to find yourself in positions where it's it's uncomfortable, something's not right. Okay, so what does that mean? That means you're starting to learn about where your discrepancies are in the culture. Uh, then you're starting to be to be mindful of of those discrepancies. You, you learn behavioral skills and you acquire the knowledge and you you know become more mindful and, and it, it's basically showing that you you know it's it's an ongoing process. You're never going to have it down 100%, but you're going to be able to get it down pretty good. But you have to you know, be mindful of these things. So this goes in stages. Reactivity to ex external stimuli, recognition of other cultural norms and motivation to learn more about them, accommodation of other cultural norms and rules in one's own mind, assimilation of diverse cultural norms into alternative behaviors, proactivity and cultural behavior based on recognition of changing cues that others do not perceive.